very good morning am i audible good morning sir Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, joining us again. Uh, uh, I, I welcome everyone, each and every one, for uh, the second day session of uh, the International Webinar Lecture Series uh, by the guest speaker, Dr. K. Rebijit, uh, from New Zealand. Uh, the topic is molecular approaches in insect pest management. uh on this uh, occasion i invite uh, mrs sugandhi to deliver a welcome address over to sugandhi sir i am audible sir yes yes you are audible you can proceed thank you a yeah, very pleasant good morning to all for the second session of international webinar lecture series is great honor and immense pleasure of mine to have the opportunity to welcome our beloved president dr m r chami sir who is backbone of this institution and source of encouragement for all of us i would like to express deep sense of gratitude to our beloved secretary dr c wasugi madam who is inspiring personality for giving her helping hand of every right path we have chosen of all of us all of members of faculty student and alumni community it's a moment of great privilege to welcome her for his auspicious occasion I would like to welcome our principal, Dr. Yam Lakshmana Swami sir, who is indomitable spirit to maintain the discipline. He is driving force to bring more laurels to our institution. I am glad to cordially welcome our outstanding speaker of today's session, Dr. K. B. Rebijit. Dr. K. B. Rebijit completed his master's in biotechnology from Bharti University, Kanpur. He started his career in ICAR. Indian Institute of Horticulture Research as a senior fellow and he's completed his doctorate in biotechnology from Kuwembu University Shimoga in 2015 he won Alfred Russel Wallace award 2016 for his doctoral work from Royal Entomological Society London United Kingdom after his doctoral degree he joined as postdoctoral researcher at department of physiology development and neuroscience at University of Cambridge United Kingdom Later in 2017 Dr K B Rebijit joined as senior scientist at the Ministry for Primary Industries Auckland and continue his work in field of molecular entomology at the MPI New Zealand He is passionate about applied entomology and has been dealing various research project and molecular entomology Last year Dr K B Rebijit won the prestigious Japanese award 2019 from Japan International Research Center for Agriculture Science for his outstanding achievement of research in agriculture and related industries in developing region Dr K B Rebijit has published more more than 36 international and nine, nine national publications and several book chapters to his credit he is also receiving he is also serving as a editor and reviewer for various research journal and participating in various entomological society society activity across the globe apart from many research project dr rebijit currently leading an interesting project entitled life after death rna to pinpoint the time of death in insect today he is going to deliver the talk on molecular approaches in insect pest management once again i welcome you sir it's my pleasure to welcome dr v selvi head and associate professor department of biochemistry who is convener of this webinar series he is great appreciator and guiding mentor in all of our departmental activities welcome you ma'am i would like to warm welcome dr k nirupama organizing secretary assistant professor department of biochemistry I welcome you, ma'am. I would like to extend warm welcome, Dr. Ajit Narendra Kannan sir, who is session coordinator, who is dynamic personality and distinguished alumni, and his personal academic achievements as a source of motivation for us. I hold cordially welcome all participants from national and international for this webinar series. Once again, on behalf of Biochemistry Department, I welcome you all. those who are contribute to make today's function a brand success 
Hope you all have a great time. Thank you, and all. Thank you, Mrs. Suganti. Uh, uh, now the session is uh, over to Dr. Rebijit. Welcome, sir. Am I audible for all of you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Yes, sir. Okay, right. Thank you. So I'm presenting my screen. Yes, sir. Let us. Yes, sir. Your screen is visible. Please proceed. Sir. Okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you for a nice brief introduction. So. Myself, Rebijit, working as a senior scientist in Plant Health and Environment Laboratory, in short, PHEL. Uh, we are coming under the Ministry for Primary Industries in Auckland, uh, Biosecurity New Zealand. So today I'm going to glance through the work which I did uh, during my doctoral and postdoctoral time. I might just briefly touch upon like the work uh, the current work which the work which I am currently doing as well. So today's talk topic was given as molecular approaches in pest management. So before going into the pest management aspect, I thought I can just glance through what we are doing as an entomologist here in New Zealand, as well as globally what researchers are doing in entomology. So before talking about the pests. So we need to know how can we categorize pests. So pests are of various types. So I'm going to talk throughout my uh, lecture on insect pests, okay? So before going into the pestiferous nature of insects, we need to know what what is entomology because entomology is the area of science where we study the insects, okay? And, it's, and their relationships to humans, plants, environment, and other organisms. Okay, so it's not only uh, that the the study, like the entomology, is not only covering on the identification, but in it encompasses various aspects of uh, studies. So, including physiology, ecology, and various other ologies as well. Okay, so before going into the uh, other aspects i would like to introduce you like the fascinating world of insects so as it's been indicated in the image you can see there are different orders of insects okay so the majority of like then the first question immediately which enters into your mind that why do we need to study these organisms okay so as all of like some of you might have heard that these insects are the most abundant animal on earth Okay, so they are uh, like they are the most numerous numbers of animals which is existing on Earth. So that's what that is what why we need to study insects. Okay, so among which you, you can know from the graph which has been from the diagram which has been put here, you know, these all are different insect orders of which Coleoptera, which possesses majority of those groups okay so it it encompasses 38 percentage of the total known species of insects and then comes the second group uh, so in coleoptera so you might not have been familiar with these terms so the coleoptera insects groups are generally referred as as beetles okay and apart from that the next biggest group is lepidoptera where as all of you know most of the butterflies comes into that group and then uh, another major group is Hymenoptera, where wasps are belonging to. And the fourth class where we need to focus on is Diptera, where many many of our common house flies and many other insects has been included, okay? So apart from that, there are different uh, orders of insects. So almost like around 15, 15 orders are there. So then again, like as on, as on when I'm talking, so the other important, things which we have to keep it in mind is like almost 1 million different types of insects has been identified so far okay but there are yet to be counted many more so it's only a small proportion of what we know so far okay yet to be counted so many millions of species and why we need to study again these insects can survive every situation in extreme temperature as well as in extreme humid and uh, cold 
conditions okay and another the most important thing which we have to focus on today's talk is like some of them are as harmful as direct pests okay so it can directly go and feed and destroy the plant or horticultural crops or agricultural crops uh, and apart from that apart from the direct pestiferous nature some of these insects can carry viruses okay so plant viruses so that's again that's a, the secondary effect of their pestiferous nature okay so they are not only being direct pests but they can also transmit various plant pathogenic viruses thereby it can cause more destruction to our agriculture scenario okay and at the same time like some of you might have familiar with some of the beneficial insects say for example honey bees okay so it's not it's not like that like some of like most of them are pestiferous nature but some of them are really beneficial to human kind so so now now i introduce like what is entomology and how things are working for an insect scientist right so the first question before going to a pest management or insect pest management we need to know like how can we identify them properly okay for those things like for the identification and classification there are several uh, uh ways of doing things at it like say for example the best and existing one the best existing uh, identification and classifying methodologies uh, as all of you might have heard the linnean system of classification okay so which has been come through systema natura okay so which has been proposed by carl linnaeus in 1735 okay so what he has done in his taxonomy is he classified organism into three kingdoms okay and further he divided into classes order genus and species so that's how he made that book okay so and apart from that there are several other classification system which is existing uh, now so the second one is uh, known as cladistics okay so cladistics is yet another approach in like biological classification system where organisms are grouped or organized into clades okay so which is based on the like most common like most recent common ancestor okay so based on that we can call different names like how how based on characters how we can classify it's based on again those terms are, we can call such the, there are various terms okay such as apomorphy plesiomorphy and autopomorphy synapomorphy so apomorphy is nothing but a derived trait that's what i meant like the most recent common ancestor okay based on certain characters so the traits or the character or the trait uh, say for example in case of apomorphy uh, a novel evolutionary trait that is unique to a particular species okay and it's not only unique to that particular species but it is present in all of its descendants as well okay so such characters and can be classified as apomorphic okay so similarly there are different terms like plesiomorphy autopomorphy synapomorphy homoplasmy so based on these like based on the ancestral trait and the derived traits classification systems are existing so such kind of systems are known as cladistic approaches and a third and yet another newly emerging area is the phylo code so where it is nothing but it's yeah in in general it is known as international code of phylogenetic nomenclature so the nomenclature has been put forth by based on some of the phylogenetic characters okay so and it's been put forth by international society of phylogenetic nomenclature in short it is known as ispn okay so these are the some of the like common classification system but among them the most widely accepted one is the linnean system okay so you might have familiar with the linnean system of classification and naming convention say for example in case of humans you might be knowing the scientific name homo sapiens so where homo stands for the genus and sapiens as a species so similarly we classify insects into its genus and species okay so and now we need to know like why do we need to classify it all or identify it all okay so before that before going into uh some of the hurdles what we are facing in identification and classification but i just wanted to introduce few numbers and terms okay so as i told you almost 1 1.1 million like 1 million species of insects has been identified so far so for us as a taxonomist 
uh, like as a general taxonomy it's not only with respect to insects but it took all almost 200 years for taxonomists okay or those who are doing classification uh, to count or to uh, count 1.7 million species which is ex existing on earth so you can you can understand how much complex the process and procedures are and those which has counted as 1.7 million which i mentioned now which is just less than 10 percentage of the estimated species on earth so there are yet to be recovered around 90 90 percentage right so it might take endless years to count all the species before it extinct okay and that is number two and the third one is less funding and dwindling interest in taxonomy See, because many of the students they might not be interested in any more in this kind of taxonomic studies okay that is another another problematic area where at the same time funding is very limited for such kind of work and another important risk where where it is arising is due to the increased international trade and travel okay so as all of you know like now trade and travel is much increased compared to the uh, like uh, two decades before how the trade and travel was happening so it's been increased quite significantly so that that increased the risk of introduction of invasive species from countries to country or even from continent to continent so we need to prevent that okay so for that we need to identify and classification is much more important and a third and uh, the fourth and another important one is like another important reason why we need to identify and classify is accelerated rate of extinction okay so before a species is a, get extincted on earth we need to count them so we need to record them that some certain species was existed on earth okay and the last and another important one is biodiversity and conservation which is somewhat in realistically it's somewhat similar to the previous point like we need to count everything as much as possible okay and we need to then only we need to we will be able to conserve them properly okay so these are some of the aspects why we need to do the identification and classification on time and then as i told you like we have a system in place okay based on morphological characters we used to classify them into genus and species okay so such kind of classification system has been introduced by carl linnaeus okay in his like the same thing like what i mentioned previously uh, through his book system and nature <clears throat> so the problem there are few problems which is associated with such kind of morphological identification so we need to address like what all are we need to understand what all are the shortfalls in morphological identification okay then only we can come out with certain strong unbiased uh, technique or tools which can overcome such kind of shortfalls okay so <clears throat> first and foremost is phenotypic plasticity and genetic variability so if like say for example i am going to talk only on insects with respect to insects so for in case of insects see if it is so closely look alike species like if it, they are really close enough then by morphological means it's really hard to separate them into two different species and by no means of morph uh, morphological identification we can we can quantify the genetic variability genetic variability can be only counted by using molecular techniques okay so that's the first and foremost thing and then we cannot distinguish morphologically cryptic taxa so i'll explain you in my forthcoming slides what is what what is the meaning of cryptic okay so it means that if they are really look alike species okay if they cannot exactly similar looking things cannot be uh, distinguished by using morphological techniques and yet another drawback is keys are effective for a particular life stage as all of you know like insects which undergo uh, what we can say different types of uh, uh, life stages okay so initially eggs will be there eggs will get converted into larvae and larvae gets transferred into pupae and pupae finally uh, become an adult so but these morphological keys are only effective for most of the keys are effective as an adult specimen so say for example if i am intercepting or if i am getting an adult uh, like a pupae or larvae i might not be able to identify them to species level based on the keys which is available for an adult species or adult specimen 
So that is yet another drawback or shortfalls in morphology. But it doesn't mean that there are no keys available, but there are few keys which is available for different life stages as well, but it is not uniform, okay? So that's what I meant. And then it's highly impossible to count sympatric and allopatric variations by using morphological thing, morphological identification like techniques. And of course, we need a specialist to do this morphological ID. Okay, otherwise we can't do it. A normal man cannot go and look into the specimen and, and tell, oh, this is this species and this is this genus. So it's not possible. So we need a specialist. That's yet another drawback. And then again, we can't identify biotypes if it's existing based on morphological ID, based on morphological characters. And of course, as I told you, like we need a holotype. That means a whole insect, like with fully functional uh, key characters are required to identify them to a species level. So that is what it's meant by holotype. Okay, so these are some of the shortfalls in morphological identification. And then we need to understand that why, so now you know there are, there are certain shortfalls, right? So based on those shortfalls, we need to think about yet another better, op, like a better, a better way of identifying and classifying things, okay? At, if possible at a much quicker pace so that we can count it in a shorter duration of time rather than waiting for another 600 years to count the rest of the 90 percentage, right? So <coughs> there the importance of DNA barcoding comes into the picture, okay? So some, some of you might have familiarized with the term DNA barcoding, okay? So as I told you, like our planet is home to 10 to 100 million species. So we know it's been, whatever we counted is much, much, uh lesser in number okay and our human mind can like able to recognize or recall perhaps maximum thousand species not more than that so that itself it's giving you a big opportunity to find a novel technique okay uh so there it comes so that's what i wanted to bring into this slide so that's why i explained all the shortfalls of morph morphological identification and all those things so what is DNA barcoding. So it's nothing but it's a novel method of identifying and classifying organisms per se. Okay, it can be plants, animal, fungus, bacteria, insects, or anything. It can be anything. And the term DNA barcoding, it decipher is nothing but the identify the species identification or recognition that is just based on the DNA sequences. Okay. So that is what the meaning of DNA barcoding. So by using a DNA, short stretch of DNA sequence, uh, we will be able to identify the species in question, okay? It can be in various particular domain of life. It can be from eukaryotes, it can be from prokaryotes. But however, before, before getting into the topic, like we need to understand these short stretch of DNA sequence, it can be of various gene regions. Okay, so that's what I indicated here. So for example, in case of animals in general, okay, including insects, we generally use CO1, side B, 12S, 16S, 28S. There are several markers among which the most popular one is and widely accepted and which has been approved by International Barcoding Consortium was is uh, CO1, okay, cytochrome oxidase one, the most widely accepted. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you cannot use certain other markers. You can use different markers, but as on when you have many uh, gene sequences, which is already deposited based on CO1, so it's easy to ID based on that per gene fragment, okay? Similarly, in case of plants, they use various markers such as MATK, RBCL, uh, PSBA, ITS, ITS1 and 2, there are several other markers, okay? And in bacteria, yet again, CO1, RPO, RPOB, 16S, uh, then tough gene, RIF. So there, there are various genes which they can use to identify organism. And again, in fungus, ITS, elongation factor, protease, ITS, CO1, RBCL. So there are different markers which people are using to identify and classify organism, okay? So yeah, that is what, the, what I meant by uh, DNA barcoding. And effectively, say for example, in the right hand side, you can see there are two different uh, organism, organelle, which is quite important in both in plants and as well as in animals. 
So in plants, as all of you know, you know chloroplast, right? So the chloroplast harbors its own its genome. Okay, it's it's called chloroplast genome. Okay, so we can use this chloroplast genome much effectively to identify or decipher a species in question. Okay, similarly, in case of animals, of course, in yes, of course in insects, so they they have an organ organelle called mitochondrion. So mitochondrion has its own its gene genome okay so the genome it consists of consisting of various markers so which you can see here which as i showed here like there are different genes which is present through the mitochondrial genome so in general we use the most accepted region the barcoding region as cytochrome oxidase one okay which has been highlighted here in red okay so why it has been utilized like why the core one is the question the next question right so it is universally accepted as the standard region for barcoding in animals okay so there are certain reasons why they pick that uh, region okay generally if we are like if we are assessing it's from mitochondrial genome so that gives certain like uh, certain features for this core one to be selected okay and why we need to choose this mitochondrial genome is the second question and there the answers are like it has uh, it has no insertion or deletions okay so and absence of introns okay and they are readily available in high copy number okay all of these matter like all of these mitochondrial genome things are maternally inherited okay and then coming to cohen why we need to specifically selected cohen is because of two re reasons one is greater differences among species okay it indicates better discriminatory power compared to other marker okay that is one thing and the second one is lower intra specific divergence is another re reason okay that means within the within the species they show lower lower differences okay but between the species they they will be able to clearly discriminate okay based on its differences so th those things uh, make them as the best marker okay which can be used for dna barcoding so then uh, in my previous slide i discussed with you like some of the shortfalls which is been like which is existing in morphological Id identification so can we cover all of them like do we have uh, the power for this dna barcoding technique to overcome all such negative effects is the next question right so here i am going to tell you like what are the advantages of dna barcoding technique okay the, the first one is they are uniform okay there is no like there is no uh, discrepancies like there is no differences so you can use cohen for various insect orders across insect orders or across animal kingdom okay even then you will be able to identify them to species or genus okay and the second thing is life stage independent let it be any life stage let it be an adult let it be an uh, pupae let it be a larvae let it be an egg let it be anything okay even let it be a small portion of the tissue okay let it be a small portion of a leg an uh, insect leg still we will be able to clearly identify identify them to species that's another another yet another important advantage of dna barcoding and then it can be used in various studies like various aspects of studies uh, say for example in conservation biology and biodiversity uh, i'm not sure like how many how many of you have heard about uh, the term called meta barcoding so meta barcoding is a like uh, method where we can uh, do enormous number of environmental sampling okay or environment sample through environment samples we can count the species to like count various uh, like organism which is present in a specific area or specific uh, specific uh, what is what we can call in a specific climatic region okay and we can count them globally so that's why i put the two important this in conservation biology and biodiversity studies and yet another important thing is determination of food web okay it can be effectively used in uh, food web identification and of course there are some of the terms which i introduce you like biotypes it can be clearly will be able to identify the biotypes based on 
DNA barcoding techniques. Yet again, molecular phylogeny can be revealed by using these barcoding approaches. And they are cost effective, can be used in both biosecurity and quarantine aspects. That's what we as biosecurity researchers, we are doing in New Zealand, okay? So, so now we need to know like what all are the steps which is which has been involved in DNA barcoding. So the DNA barcoding procedure is nothing but it's been depicted in the picture here very clearly. So initially we'll get the specimen. Okay, we'll collect the specimen. It can be from a collect. Uh, it can be from a, a person, or it can be intercepted at the border, or at the airport, or wherever. Okay. So when we are intercepting an insect, so we'll get get it as a specimen, a particular specimen. Okay. From that specimen, what we do is we uh, pull out a small tissue. Okay from the tissue sample, the tissue which we have taken from that particular insect, which will undergo for DNA extraction. And from that extracted DNA, again, we go for PCR amplification by using certain particular markers. Okay, most mostly the cytochrome oxidase one, which I, which I, as I was mentioning you in the previous slide. And then of course we'll go for sequencing. And once the sequence is ready, we'll just match it, okay? That process is called matching, process is called BLAST, okay? Or, or basic local, uh, uh, what is that? Local alignment search tool, okay? So that BLAST process will be, can be done in various platforms. So the most accepted platform is BOLD, okay? Uh, barcode, of da barcode of Life Database, okay? Which is, you can just, we can just type it in Google. You'll get to know like what is bold database. So there you can you have certain options to do a blast search and find which organism to which it is matching. Okay. Otherwise, what you can do, there are certain other uh, web database which is available, which is known as NCBI Blast. Okay. There again, you can just match your sequence and find, find which species it, it is. Okay. And apart from that. The bold database has enormous capacity, okay, which has been hosted hosted by uh, Ontario University, Canada. So what they did was like, as I told you, like when I'm collecting the specimen, I have the collection data, like from which, which region it, these insects are belonging and how it's been collected on which host it has been collected. All those collection data can also be submitted to barcode of life. Okay, along with a photograph while you are taken the specimen or collected the specimen that also can go into the domain. Okay, and apart from that, if there are any other data pertaining to this particular insects, if you or some of your colleague researchers, if they know, you can share that data also into this particular web domain. Okay, so it captures everything with respect to a specimen or with respect to a sequence. And apart from that, here the bold is having yet another like important characteristic feature. So it accept like your original sequencing trace files. So that gives you more authenticity, okay? So once you generated a particular sequence, you will get a trace file, which is out of this machine. It can be directly uploaded into the bold, okay? So that gives you more authentic authenticity for your uh, sequences. So yeah, this is how the complete analytical chain or how the like the procedure is like uh, we are doing in our lab, okay, from specimen to till the database where we identify how we identify the specimen to species. <coughs> okay, so now those things which I spoke to you till now was on the theoretical aspect. Now I'm just glancing through some of the experiments which we performed in our lab. So <coughs> mostly, as a scientist, I'm working on majority of my work was on thrips and aphids. Okay, they're small insects which has microscopic in nature. Okay, so back in India, I did quite a lot of work on both thrips and both in thrips and aphids. So, say for example, I'm I'm just going through the thrips, uh, Thysinopteran identification, other things first. So here, as I told you, like uh, I have produced almost 1,000 sequences representing 151 species of thrips insects, okay? So, and once we completed the sequence, we analyzed the sequences, we came to know that it's biased towards to adenine and thymine based on its percentage, okay? So that is as expected because most of the, most of the uh, insects 
uh, genes are tending like bias towards to AT. Okay. Uh, and also, of course, it's intraspecific, intraspecific uh, distances were ranging from zero to 10 percentage. So this 10 percentage, I'll explain you with respect to a specific term, which I mentioned you in, in the previous slide, which is known as cryptic. Okay. So, and uh, so in generally, we are supposed to get like within zero to one percentage as intraspecific distances. Okay. But it can go higher. Okay, so that what that's what it is indicated here. So and most of the thrip species, like all of the thrip species, were clearly able to discriminate based on co one. So that is what I meant by uniformity. Okay, it has uniform characteristic feature. Okay, so it gives you clear cut identification, and based on this sequences, any of the thrip species which is available in India can be clearly identified based on co one marker. Okay, so that was the conclusion out of our study. And of course, based on when we plot the phylogenetic tree, we understood that the genus Thrips and Franklin as are paraphyletic in nature because of its clading parameters, based on its clading parameters. Okay. And for <clears throat> our for generating these thousand sequences, we use this primer, which is uh, basically targeting the Cohen region, which I mentioned you, okay, which has been published by <clears throat> Hebert in 2003 and which has an amplicon product size of 700 base pair again this is the phylogenetic tree which i was mentioning to you like all of the thrip species which has been utilized in our study has been clearly were able to uh, discriminate based on this common marker and there were two different majorly there were two different big groups in thysanoptera as per se uh, the, the first one is Terebranchia, and the second one is Tubulifera, which were clearly discriminated. Okay, so that all the Terebranchia was clading into one group, and Tubulifera were on the other group. Okay, uh, and here, of course, we use some out group in order to group the in groups as a prop in a proper manner. Okay, so yes, so this is what I was mentioning about it, the cryptic nature of insect. Okay. So what I meant by cryptic nature is probably they might be genetically varying groups, okay? But it cannot be, it, it, it won't reflect on its morphology, okay? So if you are looking into the specimen, you might not be able to find any differences, but when you are looking into the mo molecular aspect, you might clearly like able to discriminate those two groups as two different groups. Okay, so here when we did some experiment, we came to know that all of the Indian population of thrips palmi, which is a which is a quite common uh, thrips species in India, which is quite commonly occurring on uh, melon crops, especially on watermelon. Okay, and they are not only uh, pests; they are like they can cause extensive damage because it can carry watermelon but necrosis virus. Okay. So they are not only being direct pests, okay? So they can be as a pest, like uh, big problem uh, as on when it's carrying this watermelon but necrosis virus. Uh, so here in India, we could, we could based on our tree, like based on our sequences, we could clearly distinguish all the Indian population were clading together and rest of the world population was together, okay? So this gave us an indication that the Indian population might be totally different, okay? So, and then we came up with an argument that they might be cryptic in nature. So again, the cryptic thing, how we prove this, I'll just explain you in the next slide. So how can we say whether a species is cryptic or not? So in 2003, when Hebert has published this paper in 2003, he proposed a thing that it's known as 10x Hebert's stool theory. Okay. So what he did was for some of the Lepidopteran group insects, which what I meant by Lepidopteran means the moths, okay, butterflies. So when he done some experiment on butterflies, he understood that the he calculated the inter subcluster and intra subcluster divergence. Okay, so when the inter subcluster divergence is 10 times higher to that of intra subcluster divergence, he, he called them as cryptic in nature. Okay, 
morphologically there is absolutely no difference but molecular wise it's it is clearly different so only if this 10x rule passed then we can call that insect as a cryptic insect so that again that means this cryptic species might like might evolve as a separate species okay as on when it moves forward during the course of evolution like another 30 30 or 40 million years it might be clearly divergent into two groups and it might elevate as a two different species okay so that's what we like that's what we have been put through in this paper which has been published in florida entomologist okay and as i mentioned it is not only for thrips palmy in our study in our the whole 151 species which we dealt we could able to clearly identify six species uh, such as thrips palmy thrips tabazi Cytothrips dorsalis, Thrips havensis, Cytothrips persiae, Franklin la occidentalis. These six species had like has the characteristic feature of being a cryptic in nature, and they, we propose that uh, DNA barcoding will be an excellent tool to decipher this cryptic diversity in Thrips. Okay, uh, so that's what on Thrips, and coming to aphids. Similar study has, has been carried out in case of aphids, which has been collected across India. Okay, and here this is what I meant by DNA barcoding. Okay, so you can see the ATGCs has been characteristically arranged. Okay, so if you are using this particular Hebert's primer, you will tend to get around 658 exactly, or it might go up to 660 or 664. Okay, so because its amplicon size is 700 base pair. So here I have removed the primer, primer from both forward and reverse side. So that's why it's becoming 658 in number, okay? So here uh, the here I have showed you like the Cohen sequence alignment for two lookalike species, okay? It's really hard to discriminate both this Fis gossipi and Mitis persicae in its early like life stages, okay? And they can co-occur on a number of crops. Okay, and both of them are again as plant viruses. It can carry plant virus vectors as a vector. Okay, so how, then now the question is, how can we discriminate them? Okay, again, if we, of course uh, DNA barcoding can be used as a tool uh, to discriminate, but the thing is that it will take time to discriminate them as like based on the sequencing method, right? It might take two or three days to get it sequenced and identify. And by the time when it reaches, okay, it might have caused significant damage to the agricultural crops, okay? So we thought about this issue, which has been raised by some of the farmers who visited our institute. And then we came up with like, uh, with a novel strategy where without sequencing, how can we identify them, okay? So, we came up with an argument like we came up with a strategy where without sequencing we can identify them like in three or four hours time okay so <coughs> there we proposed uh, the term of species specific marker okay so for the first instance what we did was like we selected some of the regions where it differentially binds okay and based on that differential binding affinity or ba based on that differential uh, like sequence nature so we developed some of the primers okay and say for example for fis gossipi our expected product size was 600 so that's this band and for the mysis persica one it was 429 so based on these differences after running a gel after the pcr method is all like after the pcr process been completed we can clearly discriminate it if the band is of 600 base pair in size it's fis gossipi and if it's for 429 it is moises persica so say for example if it's an fis gossipi totally a different management aspects has been used to control that insect pest and whereas moises persica yet another classical uh, like some other methods can be established okay so there is the importance of this species specific marker concern and again, we published this in the entomology um, USA. So for this, we tried, like it's not that only based on four primers we did it. We, uh, it was a trial and error method. So we designed different sets of primer, okay? And out of which we find the best suitable primer, okay? Which can effectively work 
excellent so without any giving any cross reaction with close related closely related species that's another important thing which you have to keep it in mind so and apart from that species specific marker we did quite a lot of work again as i mentioned dna barcoding dna barcoding has been done for around 35 species which is collected across india and yet again like all of the species which has been collected across across india has been clearly clearly discriminated based on cow one marker and as expected we could reveal cryptic nature of ephids as well okay three species of ephids out of 35 were revealed and all of them were for the first time it's been deciphered like there are three three were there like one is hypromyces cardilineus and brevicor and brassicae brachycardus helicosi were the three species again based on its intraspecific versus interspecific distance okay Yet again, this paper has been published in Bulletin of Endemological Research, which has been published from Cambridge University Press. So after that, we didn't stop there in, in case of insects. Yet again, we like uh, we went into the um, phylogenetic aspects of if it's. And for this work, we have been like uh, we have uh, collaborated with uh, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and why we like went into the molecular phylogeny of if it's were like despite several studies has been conducted the phylogeny phylogenetic aspects of various subfamilies within the fed day which is huge uh, super super family are uh, not being resolved in, in in its complete term okay so we thought okay based anyway started this work and we collaborated with iasc and many other institute across the globe and our study has clearly provided some groundbreaking re like results based on uh, like both mitochondrial as well as nuclear gene phylogenetics okay so here what 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 we contributed is like overall the higher higher level relationship of FDD has been clearly dis discriminated so it's all been grouped into proper proper terms and we have uh, we have come up with various sister relationship between like various subfamilies say for example in case of ephidini and microsiphini and ceratophidini and fodini uh, yeah apart from that uh, we could reveal many of the like monophyletic and polyphyletic paraphyletic relationship between these different groups okay tribes subtribes subfamilies all these things and also we could able to clearly discriminate like we could able to come out with the molecular dating approaches so the molecular dating of divergence reveal that most of the diversification has been happened in the late oligocene okay as per the geological time scale so in order to perform these various as we have utilized various softwares for this uh, molecular file series we have used mr bias pope and various other software and whereas to decipher the geological time scale like whereas to decipher the molecular dating study we have used beast analysis we have performed analysis okay and yeah so in, in summary what i wanted to mention is like our phylogenetic analysis provided further much like insights into the understanding of higher level relationship within ephidoidea okay so how how these the families and groups has been organized and how they are interacting with each other over its evolutionary pattern so that's that was till my work which i completed during my phd and postdoc and currently as a scientist in new zealand or uh, working on biosecurity might not help me all this technique so we need some real time procedures protocols in place which can give us answer, an answer within one hour or two hour time okay so why is that required say for example as i don't know have you heard about the like uh, the biosecurity new zealand so we are a particular group who works on biosecurity aspects for the for our country for new zealand okay so here what we do is we don't allow to settle any alien insects bacteria viruses uh, to settle in new zealand okay so we identify identify at the border okay if it has got through border we have post border techniques to screen them and to eliminate them or to eradicate them okay 
So say, for example, an insect has been intercepted at the border when a passenger comes from India or from certain, certain other parts of the globe, captured at the airport, okay? So, and if it's been captured, it's not, not only through passengers. We, as you know, like, as I mentioned in my talk, that trade is a big thing now, okay? International trade and travel is a big hazard. So through trade components as well, we, go, we get in, like, uh, insects are, supposed to get into the country okay as both dead and alive so we always look for dead and alive insects and we need to identify them okay and as quickly as possible to take a preventive measure in place or to have a proper management aspect for that uh, particular incident right so for that what we do is we we need a uh, very peculiar assays to be developed in our lab so what we generally do is like we do the real time PCR assays for various insects. Okay. So for example, here I showed you one of the fruit fly species, which is known as Bactrocera cucubite. And New Zealand is the only one country which is completely free from fruit flies. Okay. And so we don't entertain kind of fruit flies into New Zealand. We are very keen on, okay, we have different assays for different species, which can be like immediately processed and we'll be able to get an identification one or two hour time. So for here, I as I showed you here, we develop our own our assays, okay, and which will go for IONS accreditation, okay. So IONS is a particular body, something similar to ISO 9000 in India where we get accreditation system for our assays which we developed in our lab okay so here what we do is we develop primers and probes which work specifically for that insect and once it's been developed we'll like we'll check its specificity repeatability reproducibility everything based on series of series of tests which has been uh, like done on a real machine which is an exp expensive machine and then we have to like, if we want to go for an accreditation system, as I mentioned you, like we need to check various parameters to negotiate uh, it's about its specificity and sensitivity. Probe concentration, BSA concentration, primer probe, annealing temperature extension, magnesium chloride concentration, sensitivity, specificity, all these things has been adequately verified. And once the assay is ready, we can clearly tell them that the sensitivity based on the serial dilution technique will be able to even capture even a single nucleotide, like single molecule of DNA if it's present in that uh, area, will be able to capture it, okay? So based on this technique, what we, right now, what we are trying to do is we are going a step ahead based towards to eDNA, environmental DNA. So if DNA alone, even if it is comes through our border, will be able to recognize. So that's what we are moving ahead, okay? So yeah, so it's not only barcoding and species specific marker, but we have certain other things which is in place, which is known as real-time qPCR assays. And it's not only qPCR assays as, again, as I mentioned, like uh, we have certain ongoing research programs as well in our lab. So here we do quite a lot of research on various diagnostic aspects where we do two important things are lamp assay development. It's nothing but loop mediated isothermal amplification. Both of these techniques are in general, it's known as isothermal amplification, okay? So and yet another one is recombinase polymerase uh, amplification, so RPA. So both of these techniques relatively works on a, a single temperature, but it has, it's totally different from that of the PCR based on various strategies, like it has internal primers and various primer combinations, okay? So it's, it's generally it's much, much of a complicated technique compared to a qPCR or PCR method, okay? But there are some modern diagnostic tool which has getting ready uh, for its utility in our border and post-border scenario, okay? So yeah, that's what I just wanted to mention in that slide. So that, all are the ways to identify insects, okay? So now we need to know, like, okay, we identify, then what is the question? So in order to, like, understand, like, how we can manage this, the first question was, like, the first thing we need to identify them, then only we can go for management, 
Okay. So as a pest management technique, I would like to introduce you one of the molecular method which we utilized in our lab. So here I'm going to talk about RNA interference, which is a Nobel Prize winning uh, concept, RNAi, or which is uh, otherwise, which is known as gene silencing. Okay. Uh, so before introducing this RNA, I just wanted to like briefly explain you what is what what is the meaning of RNA. Okay. So RNA is nothing but it's it's a it's a natural phenomenon. Okay. The naturally occurring nucleotide-based defense mechanism, which has been well elaborated in basal genomes. Okay. Say for example, Cyanobacteria elegans. Okay. Or even in say for example, bacteria. Okay, bacteria is a classical example. When bacteriophage attacks bacteria, okay, bacteria knows how to survive. Okay, even if it's an attack is happening. Okay, so that's that's where this RNA. That's what I told a naturally occurring nucleotide-based defense mechanism. Okay, so then how can they how can they do that? So it's through controlling the gene expression. That's how it can be done. And for what it for what it is happening naturally, it is just to protect its genome. Okay, against various uh, elements, which as I mentioned here in retro, retro elements, okay, transposons, RNA viruses, etc. Okay, there, there could be anything. It can harm a genome. So organisms tend to protect their genome by based on different molecular methods and place. So one among them is RNAi or gene silencing. And yes, of course, RNAi is a process by which dsRNA directs sequence specific degradation of mRNA. So that's why I on top gene expression okay so this is not gene knockout it to be very clear this is only gene silencing okay we are degrading mrna to a level okay we are not knocking out okay so it's totally different so now we know how the mechanism like how this rnai works in per se in in any of the organism okay so say for example as i told you like when a dsrna comes into the body or comes into the in, into the cell so normally any any animal groups which they possess an enzymes called a group of enzymes called dyser so dyser dyes these dsrna into small fragment which is known as sirna it's nothing but small interfering rna okay so once the sirna has been produced immediately a group of protein ribonucleoprotein complexes which is known as risk okay risc so rna induced silencing complex protein okay so which comes and takes over this sirna molecule once it's been taken over the risk getting trans like it's get transferred into an activated risk complex so by the time which gets activate become an activated risk it will retain only one of the strand, which is known as the gate strand. Okay, the passenger strand gets removed out of this risk complex, and it gets degraded in the cytoplasm. Okay, and the retained strand, or the particular strand which has been retained in the activated risk, which gets redirected to the mRNA or the messenger RNA, which binds perfect complementarity. Okay, which shows perfect complementarity, and as on when it based on the activity of this activated risk complex, it gets chewed into fragments. Once the mRNA gets degraded, or once the mRNA gets broken down into pieces, as all of you know, translation won't occur, no protein production. Okay, thereby the gene expression gets lowered. Okay, so that's the general mechanism. I'll explain you a bit more in my upcoming slide. But before that, I just wanted to introduce you how can we apply this technique in insect, okay? So in order to understand that, you, we need to understand a little bit of physiology of insects, okay? So as I mentioned, like insect, as an adult insect, if you are taking, okay, which well well-grown adult insect, which has three different body parts, one is head, thorax and abdomen okay the head possesses various type of mouth parts okay it could be like uh, sucking and piercing okay so as on when it it takes its food okay uh, if the food goes through the thorax region to the foregut 
okay the first place where it reaches food is the forget okay so generally in forget nothing is going to happen and from the forget it immediately entered in the mid gut okay mid gut is the uh, place where many of this chemical complex reaction is going to take place as on as on when it enters this mid gut the abdomen region we know it it has a particular lining of cells okay epithelial cells has been lined in the mid gut region which has slightly higher absorption rate okay so we need to understand those cells what all are those cells processes so in in those cells if you are looking like say for example if we are introducing a dsrna into the cell it possesses something called sid1 which is nothing but systemic interference defective one which is one complex which is relatively uh, like smaller in size it's just like a nuclear pore okay it acts as the transportation gateway for this dsrna to get into the cell it's not only that sid1 if it's there the transportation occurs into the cell but there are many other mechanism which can like through which it can happen okay don't think that it's if sid1 is there only then the transportation is happening no there are many many processes say for example endocytosis is another way okay so but apart from that like most of the cells which has this sid1 okay and apart from that as i told it possesses dyza dyza will helps to chew this dsrna into small molecules which is known as sarna and also it it possesses risk rna induced silencing complex and then it possesses its own its nucleus of course right so and it possesses it might or it might not possesses another fragment known as sid2 systemic interference defective 2 so if two fragment if it is there it's then it's very easy to conduct the silencing signal from cell to cell okay then we need not have to introduce this dsrna into every cell but it can just pass through the cell through this sid2 okay if it's entered in this cell it can pass through sid2 to the next cell okay so it can happen that and then there are something called rdrps which is nothing but rna dependent rna polymerase so it helps to uh, revive the dsrna which has been entered into this uh, cell okay which helps to like so based on it's like as i told you it's a polymerase so which by utilizing this dsrna template it can synthesize dsrna again and again okay generally these rdrp complex are not present in higher higher organisms okay so i'll come to that details in my coming slide so which which organism possesses what and how it's working so again as i told you bit more if you are going into the molecular aspects of risk loading and all those things like as on i i told you when the dsrna gets into the system or into the cell uh, it gets chopped into two like it get into the shortened version like which is known as sarna molecules right so as on when the dyza choose this dsrna into a same or sarna molecules which of course based on thermodynamics uh this thing uh, features it pro it it produce a more stable and, and less stable end okay within this sarna okay all of these energy things are cutting all of these uh, thermodynamic things is happening because of uh, based on the atp uh, using this energy in the form of atp okay so so what happens is the more stable end so based on this more and less stable end uh, the binding is going to happen okay so there are as i told you these all are nuclear protein complexes okay so there is some component which is known as r2d2 and dyza2 so the r2d2 binds to the more stable end of this newly produced sarna molecule pushing the dyza2 to the less stable end okay so how it's happening is the r2d2 it can sense the 5 prime phosphate of the passenger strand so that is what i told the passenger strand is the one which is going to get out of this complex and it will get destroyed in the cytoplasm later okay but it can sense the 5 prime phosphate that's how it selectively takes the more length okay pushing the dyza to the less stable end as it's been done complex is known as risk loading complex so it's in short in known as rlc okay so that is an inactivated form of slight like Uh, risk complex is starting there okay so 
but when a risk complex like hollow risk complex it has risk complex okay so where it has to it has the dicer 2 has to interact with a group of enzymes called argonate proteins okay so where again this is another nucleoprotein complex where it has its own its elements okay so among which the most important one is the argonate 2 okay argonate 2 or ago 2 okay so what happens in this like once the rlc is formed rlc gets reacted with the hollow risk and argonate 2 comes in contact with the dicer 2 okay and thereby it forms a complex which is known as hollow risk complex okay and yet it's it's not been like it, it's an inactivated risk complex okay so then what happens is like in the molecular mechanism if we are looking more into that okay once the argonate protein comes in bind with comes in contact with the dicer 2 the argonate protein sends signal for another enzymatic activity we don't know which enzyme it is but we generally call it as unwind this okay because it has it is promoting the activity of unwinding of these two different strands and this unwind is separates these two strands okay and the risk complex knows which need to be retained and they call it as the gate strand okay they know which strand to be removed out of this complex that strand is known as passenger strand it has nothing to do with its activity so it gets out of this complex and it immediately it gets destroyed inside the cytoplasm okay and then it retain what it means is the gate strand will be pushed from the uh, from the dicer to the argonate complex so that's been clearly indicated here okay which has been pushed the gate strand will be pushed into the argonate complex based on certain uh, characteristic feature which i'm going to show you in the next slide okay so so based on certain characteristic feature will be pushed into the argonate uh argonate complex of that particular risk complex and then this enter as a mature risk complex which this will gate this gate strand to the messenger strand and thereby it can go and bind there and it it helps in the like chopping okay chopping of mrna okay so this is what i was mentioning you the pass domain so i told you argonate protein right it's a big again it's a big a group of protein okay uh, so so the risk what is the function of risk so it mediate the cleavage of target mrna by slicer so how it's how is it happening and what how it can functionally get it done by this argonate group so the argonate protein which can like has three different domains okay uh, it has four different domains okay this first one is but the major two are pas and pv so the PAS recognize the termini of SARNA. So that's what I told you. So the PAS domain has a groove-like structure to hold the three prime end of the single stranded SARNA molecule. There it holds the three prime end of the SARNA and thereby it can clearly get, take this SARNA molecule to the mRNA. Okay. And also there is an another like structure which is known as pv okay this pv has an rna's h like domain that means it can cleave it can cut okay so and apart from that it has rna's helicase activity as well it's all are mediated by atp dependent activity again so what what i'm what i'm trying to tell you the pass domain which holds the three prime end of the sarna molecule which brings the uh the sarna molecule comes in contact with the mrna and as on when it comes in contact with the mir mrna uh, sorry uh, mrna so it gets base paired okay so once the base pairing is happening immediately pv knows where to cut and how to cut that i'm going to explain you in the next slide so here as i told like this is our mrna say for example this is our mrna which will be having a polya tail and five prime capping as all of you know and then this is our small interfering rna okay so what happens is the pv will start counting from the five prime end of the sarna and it starts counting one, two three four five six seven eight nine ten and as on when it counts ten immediately to the middle of next base it cuts there exactly in the in between 10th and 11th it won't go and cut anywhere anywhere else in that 
only it can cut in this 10th and 11th base pair okay and if a mismatches at the site of cleavage that means if a mismatch is if u is matching with c here then the cleaving is not going to happen so that is what we meant that this method is very very highly sequence specific in nature okay so any of either of these base pair if it is not matching mismatch is happening then it the cleavage process won't happen it it won't help in the degradation of mrna okay but if some mismatches are there in the upstream or downstream to certain like certain level or certain amount certain percentage can be tolerated by various extent okay so yeah these are the things which you have to keep it in mind and then yet another thing which uh, what i wanted to mention is the variation in rna theme so <clears throat> again as i mentioned like in plants there are various methods how the rna works in a different way and in case of insects like in plants as i told you they have argonate protein in argonate protein which is present in all plant insects and nematodes but whereas you can see rdrp which is quite well effect effectively they are present in plants so what happens is the secondary sarna can be produced within the cell okay so that helps to have better results for rna in case of plants rather than insects because insects it doesn't have any rdrp in its body or in, in in its particular cellular machinery but whereas again in nematodes they do possess as rdrp as well as argonate protein so secondary sarna can be produced we attempt to get like better results for rna experiments in nematodes so it's been clearly depicted in the phylogenetic tree here so as i told you like rdrp which has not been elaboratedly present in the higher organism but whereas some of the lower lower order organisms like ticks and c elegans both rdrp and sids are present but sids for to a certain level it's been extensively distributed in almost every group except drosophila melanogaster which is the housefly which you see in our every houses so they do they do not possess both rdrp and sid okay so but still people have done quite a lot of rna experiment in drosophila still it can it can cause significant amount of down regulation so that's what i meant to you like uh, that's what i introduced the concept of endocytosis like there are various other mechanisms as well it's not only that sid sid structures can uh, bring the double stranded rna into the cell okay there are various other machinery which can do the same kind of functions in insect cell cell line or insect cells so apart from that we need to know like we need to understand which all are the genes which we can target to have a better pest management strategy all right so that's the next thing so for that various genes can be targeted so some of the examples which i given here say, say for example if i i can target many genes like uh, like per se but before targeting a gene i need to mention i need, I need to keep one in, one thing in mind that some of the genes say for example uh, actin okay cytoskeleton actin and myosin which are like quite similar from throughout like our uh higher order organism like vertebrates and invertebrates so that means it sh it shares the common signature sequences okay throughout the animal kingdom so if you are designing a dsrna specifically for actin and myosin it might or might not work with some other organism as well so it might cause a non target or off target effects okay so need to be really careful in selecting the genes which we need to what we need to target okay so for that say for example if i can target some of the detoxification uh, genes which are which insects are using okay so plants like when insects uh, do a test bite on plant okay so plants do tend to react in its own its way it doesn't mean that plant will go and bind like bite and eat whatever they want no it gives a test bite and see how the plants are producing what kind of chemicals are producing and if they have a detoxification system in its body insects body so they will wait how the plants are reacting if its plants are producing really nasty chemicals they won't feed on that they will go back okay so there are certain detoxification enzymes or like uh, detoxification genes which are quite keen to like Uh, to negotiate the uh, production of 
uh, what is that uh, plant uh, allylo chemicals okay when which they produce during the test bite of an insect so such kind of genes are can be classified as like uh, detoxification group of enzymes or uh, genes which are generally gst glutathione transferase cyp450 carboxylesterase similarly in case of digestion insects require certain uh, genes which is uh, serine protease protease coding genes chymotrypsin secrase 1 2 3 there are several other genes which is involved in digestion metamorphosis of course that's another important thing so this is what i was talking like the conversion of from one uh, phase of the one phase of life to the other one so egg get metamorphosed into the larvae larvae metamorphose into pupae and pupae metamorphose into adult so for these metamorphosis the process of metamorphosis requires some kind of enzymes or genes which need really need to be uh, quite keen to get along with that process which are generally which is known as juvenile hormones okay and jhmt is yet another gene so i'll i'll go much into the details of jhmt and jh synthesis okay as an example and then again cytoskeleton actin and myosin but keep it in mind i told you this is very like we need to be very uh, like very specific when using this kind of actin and myosin genes okay in our experiment and yet again nerve impulse transmission acetylcholinesterase. trace this is another group of highly vulnerable gene which again it can be of having off target effect if we are not very specific if they are not very specifically selected mid gut ph altering one vatpsh vatps other classes a and e and all and then pheromones fatty acid desaturates are the classical one and all faction like obps and csp obps and csps are nothing but order and binding proteins and uh, chemosensory proteins so that means insects do tend to use their all faction like how they can smell quite heavily like based on the smell Mm, affinity they used to select their food okay so yeah we'll so these are the general way how we can classify some of the genes and you can choose whichever the gene which you wanted to target okay so i'm going to talk to you of them like very keenly but before that i just wanted to give you the advantages of rna strategy so the, most of the things which you were already discussed like dsrna rather like why we need to use like dsrna technique is rather it's 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 much more uh specific and sen sensitive okay compared to the antisense uh uh single standard antisense rna technology okay so you might have heard about the antisense technology so yeah which is much better compared to the uh, ss antisense rna technology and high degree uh, high degree of specific gene silencing that's what i meant by sequence specific and molecular uh, potent and effective method okay and silencing can be introduced into different development developmental stages that's what i already told we can target some of the metamorphose genes that's another thing and systemic silencing so it's it can cause systemic silencing i'll talk to you like on systemic silencing while i'm presenting some of my results okay so that means it can pass from like pass from cell to cell very quickly okay so that's what i meant by systemic silencing and high level of safety to the non target organism if we are very peculiar in selecting your like very particular in selecting your gene targets then it is very specific and ex ex uh, excellent safety for the known target organisms can be acquired okay silencing effect can be passed through generations that's another it, but it is not possible in all the experiment but certain things like sometimes it might be passing through generations okay and compatible with any other insect pest management you might have heard about this bt technology okay bacillus thuringiensis bt cotton so it's compatible with such kind of technique and then we need to understand like after developing all this dsrna and all those things how to develop like how to administer right so that's another thing so we can give as a per os feeding like we can feed the larvae or we can introduce the dsrna through a semi synthetic diet and apart from that in the lab in lab procedure in order to start an experiment we can use the micro injection method so yet again like there are as i told you like when we are doing an experiment we know that there are certain factors which influence the success of our experiments right so similarly like sometime it might affect like if we are giving higher concentration of dsrna the result might be better okay sometime if we are reducing the concentration of dsrna it might be giving better results but these all are things like which we need to do experiment trial and error method to find which how it is influencing but some of the factors are like concentration of dsrna length of dsrna persistence of silencing effect how long it's persisting 
nucleotide sequences are they really key you know very uh, like are they very what is that clearly dis discriminating from species to species and how can we do that all these things okay and can be it's another yet another important thing is which life stage to be targeted okay so sometimes larvae might give more potency compared to adult okay so we need to target at that time the larval um, uh, pest management okay so here as an example i'm going to go through two experiments okay the first one i'm going to talk about the juvenile homot this is what i was talking to you like in metamorphosis right so before setting up an experiment we need to understand some of the physiology of insect and how these things are working in in its body right so <clears throat> before going into these details you, i need to introduce the uh, like the term because insects do possess a brain okay they have a, like they have a particular region in brain which is known as ca which is corpora alata okay where this juvenile hormone synthesis takes place in order to do this uh, in order to synthesize the juvenile hormone which requires a uh, what is that uh, pre molecule or pre existing molecule which is known as farnesoic acid which has been synthesized from a series of uh, like chemical reaction okay so here what happens is in order to convert this farnesoic acid into juvenile hormone it requires an enzyme which is known as which has been encoded by a gene which is almost 1.2 kb in size which codes for juvenile hormone acid methyl transferase so this enzyme converts the farnesoic acid into juvenile hormone so say for example if i can block this ghamt gene the conversion of farnesoic acid to juvenile hormone is not going to happen so that means the metamorphosis can't happen in larvae or any other life stage so what happens is complete cessation of larval feeding larvae cannot feed okay as a result larvae will die okay so that's one method say for example if i cannot for some reason i'm not selecting this then the juvenile hormone will get produced and then still it requires the second way so the juvenile hormone is not only in corpora alata it has to be transported to various various uh, parts of the body through hemocyl okay so what happens is for that it requires yet another binding protein okay to transport this produced juvenile hormone to reach its various uh area of its body or various uh what is the various tissues in their body okay so for that they use jhbp so if i can block this jhbp jhbp is nothing but juvenile hormone binding protein so it's been indicated his square bracket okay so this if we can block this juvenile hormone binding protein gene which is encoded by 1kb uh thing gene so if i can block that then the binding won't happen the jh will get degraded in the hemocyl hence it cannot survive okay so complete cessation of feeding it will again results in mortality similarly if this i am not targeting i can have another meta uh, another receptor which is known as methoprin receptor okay y yet again for the transportation okay and juvenile hormone if it's if the methoprin receptor is not available which has been encoded by a gene of 1.5 kb in size again similar thing it cannot go undergo metamorphosis complete cessation and insect can't survive to the next level so with respect to that like we designed certain experiments okay so here we targeted like various genes okay so here we targeted jhbp and then obp2 i'm going to explain you in the next next part of my slide so we'll we'll wait for that so but still you need to understand that we designed three sets of primers one is for pcr pcr means what i meant is i amplified these particular genes obp2 jhbp vatpsh and acting as an internal control i used to validate my qpcr experiment okay qrt pcr experiment i used as an internal control so i designed the primers for pcr experiments and then i designed the primers for dsr and synthesis okay by tagging the t7 rna polymerase because i was using the t7 in vitro transcription method to synthesize the dsr rna in the lab okay and then to verify the genes really got silenced or not we used real time pcr studies to understand whether it's really down regulated or not okay. so based on my 
PCR primers, we amplify the products, like we amplify the genes, various genes from aphids, aphids gossipi. Uh, so, and then we produce a phylogenetic tree to assess whether are they matching with the uh, similar similar group of uh, genes in uh, in the what we what we say phylogenetically closer organism. And we cladded them to appropriately, and we came to know that yes, they are clading properly, and they all are good. The sequence wise, it's it's exactly same. Okay, and then again, we we use VATPSH. It's again VATPSH is an active <coughs> transepithelial cation transport uh, helping gene which has been encoded in insects. Okay, so what happens is if if we are blocking this VATPSH, pH alteration is is going to happen in its body. Okay, especially in the abdomen. So we expected some shrinking in in its body because of its the, the pH uh, change, pH alteration. Okay, so we'll come to know like how is it going to affect in the body, and that can significantly cause mortality. Okay, and JSBP also it can cause significant percentage of mortality. And we done the experiment as I told you by using in vitro transcription method. I synthesized the dsRNA. And then what we did was like we, in order to the, deliver the thing, deliver the DSRNA, as I mentioned, we use a semi-synthetic diet method. So what we did was like we prepared a sucrose diet for aphids uh, and we done a parafilling feeding method, okay? Because these aphids are phloem feeding insects, okay? Which generally have strong stylet that can penetrate the xylem cells without rupturing them. Okay, and it can reach the phloem cells to suck the phloem sap. That's how it generally feed on plants. So we need to devise that kind of an, that kind of an experimental setup. So what we did was to, we sandwiched the sucrose diet along with the DSRNA molecule in two diff, like in between like uh, two parafilm layers, so that it can penetrate through one of the parafilm and it takes the sap. Okay. So yeah, here you can you know like the uh, like we have taken the image under Leica M two not five microscope. Here you you can see very clearly that uh, how how good the control insects and how badly they look like, and most of them are dead. Okay, after the treatment. So again, here more clear images. So the control aphids were really active. Okay, where here again we used another another non-target DSRNA, but still they were like they they didn't show any kind of an instinct problem. Okay, they were very happy, they were crawling around. But the other one, the treated one, and here as I told you, like VATPSH, we expected severe results, and you can see its its, it's body parts, like its abdomen has got shrunk because of the pH alteration in its body. And not only that, we didn't stop just with that, and we went and we went and done the real-time PCR experiment to prove that yes, indeed, the gene relative expression has been lower significant level. And then what we done is we calculate the percentage of silencing, and we corroborated with the percentage of mortality. So as in the picture, as in the image showed that. As the time progresses and as that concentration increases, significant reduction in silencing has happened, and in in which is directly proportional to its mortality. So at 96 hours, highest mortality is achieved and highest uh, relative expression level has been indicated by uh, uh, that particular uh, what is that gene? Okay, that particular concentration of that particular gene. And similarly, in JHBP, we expected like we got the similar result, like directly the relationship was directly proportional, where the percentage of silencing was directly proportional to its percentage mortality. And again, but when we combine this picture together, we came to know that there could be the existence of systemic silencing. As on when we are closely looking into the graph, we can see that this, the green peaks, which has been deciphered at the percentage silencing of VATPS. Okay, so the VATPSH, you can see it attained within 48 hours, it attained almost 55 percent days. Uh, what is that silencing? And even at 72 hours, it was on par with the first 48 hours, and it went up to 65 percent at 96 hours for the highest concentration. But if you are looking at the other way around for the JSBP, 
at 48 hours it showed 25 percentage and at 72 hours it went up to 35 percentage and even after 96 hours it it shooted up to 75 percentage so that indicated that there are some kind of cell to cell communication and spread is happening across the cell okay so that's why we we came up with an argument that the in, it gives us an indication that systemic silencing existing in a physical city and now i showed you that how the mortality can result okay but we purposefully done another experiment where we need to trial do the trial and error like it, it doesn't mean that only mortality causing genes can be ut utilized in pest management no we have to have better strategies right so for that we selected some of the old faction related genes in uh fs gossip so what we did was we used odon binding protein which is known as obps okay for that again by using the same pcr primers we uh, amplified the gene we predicted its structure using fire 2 software and we classified them into it's based on its phylogenetic uh, tree and it was cladding properly and then what we did was we done the personal silencing okay so we were knowing like from the previous experiment we we understood that 48 and 96 hours is enough 24 hours were not significant enough so we restricted to two hours like two treatment and then what we did was like as i told you this obp2 won't kill the insect okay so what it does is it it reduces the olfaction okay that's all so we need to measure the olfaction are they really able to recognize the smell so that is the question here right so for that we devise another experiment which is known as eag electroantinogram response for that insect so which is which we have done with a small uh, like small experimental setup in a different lab where they had this eag facility electroantinogram and what we did was we just cut the head portion of the insect and which has been connected to an electroantinogram and we gave three uh, four different clues okay so the first one was sucrose which is a diet they usually they can we assume that it can sense its smell then we gave honey and then cotton cotton is the host plant of course they can recognize the smell of cotton and then we done we give one another chemical which is known as indole indole is an ov position attractant for insect okay and it can help to identify the suitable position to lay their egg on the plant surface so of course we know that indole is a chemical clue uh, as an OV position attract and it can it smell okay so we calculated okay so from the experiment we came to know that 96 hours has given resulted the bust uh, down regulation of that gene okay so the relative expression was so low at 96 hours we picked those insect species and we did the eag response study so in eag response what we find was like it was showing specific degradation like it was showing lower responses so how we measured was here i have showed you the electroandrographic response you can see that we use lac is a control here for as a control apart from the non treated control so you can see the lac is a control it's, it was giving a clear cut spike okay it was clearly giving an indication that it is recognizing but whereas in rna treatment you can see it showed critically reduced responses in all of the treatment like cotton sucrose honey and indoor but whereas in ds rna like ds lac is at control which were showing clear cut peak that it can clearly discriminate but whereas the rna treated it showed clear cut diminishes uh, diminishing effect in its recognition of smell so in summary what we what i wanted to conclude is that diet mediated knockdown of target genes in, is an invaluable tool for insect pest management okay rnai studies also proved that like in fis gossipy it's not only those genes which are quite keen that it can result in mortality can be used for insect pest management okay but uh, some genes such as fis like ag obp2 or an binding protein plays crucial role okay in host seeking detection of ov position attractants uh, and as a result we suggest that obp2 can also be used as a practicable target for rnai mediated gene silencing uh, in hemipteran insect pests because we done it on, on a hemipteran pest but it doesn't mean that only it can be applied in hemipteran groups but it can be used in some other insects as well 
and to conclude that uh, currently we are like we in uh, MPI as a biosecurity being here in New Zealand. Uh, I am leading three different projects. One is on life after death, which is track like by using the RNA to track the exact pinpoint time of death of an insect. Okay, and second one is as I mentioned the isothermal assays and uh, clubbing it with in environmental DNA as a modern biosecurity diagnostic toolkit. And the third one is on GMO diagnostics, where we are like we are totally against the GMO materials. Okay. So these are the three things which are going currently in our lab. So that's all from me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rebjit, for an extending and uh, very uh, clear uh, explanations and presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, it is really helpful for the students uh, and mostly for the uh, being a zoology. And uh, we have uh, recorded this uh, meeting also, so we can uh, we can um, circulate to our students, uh, the zoology students especially those who are not able to attend in this meeting. Uh, with your permission, just we are uh, we will be sharing in our college itself, not outside in our yeah. college itself. Uh, okay. I think hope is not a problem for you, right? No, no, no. Thank you so much. Now, uh, I, yeah. So now uh, I just wanted to before going to the conclusion, I just wanted to, to tell about the next tomorrow's program. It is by Dr. Sinavasan Jaraman, assistant professor of uh, biomedical sciences, faculty of science, University Tunku Abdul Rahman, Kampar, uh, Malaysia. The topic will be the nanoparticles as an alternative antibacterial agent. The time will be at 2 p.m. tomorrow, Indian time. And uh, uh, so tomorrow, so second December of uh, uh, this month, uh, tomorrow, it's 2 p.m. So now uh, I just want to invite uh, Dr. Vishwanathan, Ashwin Professor of Biochemistry, to deliver a lot of thanks. Very good morning to all, and I'll present here. Sir, am I audible? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, sir, okay. So very good morning to one and all present here. It's my pleasure to propose the vote of thanks on this valuable occasion of this international webinar series. Foremost, I convey my sincere gratitude to our Honorable President. Dr. M. R. H. Chami, sir, who provided us an invaluable support and guidelines. I extend my heartfelt gratitude to our beloved secretary, Dr. C. E. Vasaki, ma'am, for her continual motivation and remarkable presence of at all time. Thank you so much, madam. I also convey my sincere thanks to our principal, Dr. M. Lakshman Swami, sir, for his constant encouragement to conduct this program. I would extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. R. Shivaprakash, Associate Dean and R. &D and Dr. S. R. Madan Shankar, Dean Academics, who have contributed that immense support to this event. I convey my heartfelt thanks to the convener, Dr. V. Selvi, ma'am, Associate Professor and Head of the Department of Biochemistry, who has given her full moral support to this webinar series. Thank you so much, ma'am. I would like to convey my wholehearted thanks to our resource person, Dr. K. K. B. Rebichit, for his wonderful and lively session. This session, which he dealt on the title of Molecular Approaches in Insect Pest Management, has really enlightened our knowledge. Hence, the entomology is new to some of our participants. Dr. Rebichit clearly explained the basics and brief introduction about entomology. Then, Molecular Approaches, which he explains for the insect pest management, is a key to us to explore our knowledge in the insect biology. And also, it's a real eye-opener to us uh, to understand about the molecular approaches such as uh, DNA barcoding, qPCR assays, siRNA, etc., and it is uh, help us to carry on our research in that field in future. Thank you so much, sir. Our heartfelt thanks to you, sir. Thank you. Then Thank I you, also. Let me just say something. Yeah, yeah. Yes, proceed, 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 proceed. Yeah. I also want to thank the organizing secretary, Dr. K. Nirvama, and the session coordinator, Dr. R. T. Narendra Assistant Professors of the Department of Biochemistry for conducting this program. Finally, I am very grateful to the participants from our college and from various institutes for their active participation in this session. Once again, I thank you all for uh, your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vishwa, and uh, I express my sincere thanks to Dr. Webhijit, uh, the 